We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender! Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 famous speeches. Where did your Christ come from? He came from God and a woman. Man didn't have nothing to do with it. For this list, we'll be looking at pivotal speeches by famous orators. Sometimes history turns on the words of great people. These are some of those speeches. Did we leave any of your favorite speeches off our list? Speak out in the comments below. Number 10. Give me liberty or give me death. Patrick Henry, 1775. At pivotal points in history, a spoken word can be the first pebble that starts an avalanche. Give me liberty or give me death! In 1775, the individual American colonies each had to decide where they stood on revolution. Virginia, with its size and agriculture, was the largest and most powerful of the colonies. The revolution would rise or fall there. At the Second Virginia Convention, lawyer and politician Patrick Henry gave a powerful speech in favor of raising a militia. Luminaries like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson were present. Henry stirred the hearts of his fellow Virginians when he uttered the famous words, Give me liberty or give me death. The assembly was stunned into silence by his passion and spurred to action. Number 9. I am prepared to die. Nelson Mandela, 1964. We want equal political rights. One man, one vote. I have dedicated myself to this struggle of the African people. Decades before his release from prison and election to president, Nelson Mandela was an organizer and activist. He fought for years against colonialism and apartheid in South Africa. In the mid-1960s, he and his colleagues were arrested for sabotage. Refusing to participate in a show trial, he and his fellow defendants opted for a speech from the dock in lieu of testimony. I have cherished the idea of a free, democratic society where all persons live together in harmony. For three hours, Mandela stood in the courtroom decrying the injustice of the apartheid state. The I am prepared to die speech was a defining moment for democracy in South Africa. It is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. Though he was sentenced to life in prison, his words transformed the hearts of many of his countrymen, who continued the struggle until his release 27 years later. Number 8. I will fight no more forever. Chief Joseph, 1877. Great speeches are often shouts of defiance. In our darkest hours, the right words can repel fear, inspire hope, and beat back despair. But an orator's words can also mark defeat and tragedy. After the U.S. government broke a treaty with the Nez Perce people, forcing them from their homeland, three young warriors killed a group of white settlers. The tribe's leader, Chief Joseph, led his people in flight from the U.S. Army, hoping to reach Canada. When the army caught up months later, he surrendered and gave a short but haunting speech. His words were part lamentation, part acceptance of a future in which his people might live. He spoke with the voices of millions crying out to be remembered. Number 7. Inaugural Address, John F. Kennedy, 1961. Not every U.S. president had the gift of gab. John F. Kennedy was one who did. He inspired an entire nation to shoot for the moon. Well, space is there and we're going to climb it. And the moon and the planets are there. And new hopes for knowledge and peace are there. The previous year, JFK gave arguably the best speech of his life at his inauguration. The rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. By 1961, Americans were exhausted and scared. Two world wars with a Great Depression in between had led only to another terrifying conflict, the Cold War. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. At 43, the youngest president ever to be elected was swept into power on a wave of optimism and hope. Kennedy hammered that optimism home, emphasizing service and unity. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. A new generation had taken the reins to usher in a better future, and it was up to all of us to do it together. Here on Earth, God's work must truly be our own. Number 6. Ain't I a Woman? Sojourner Truth, 1851. Women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches. After escaping slavery, 
Isabella Bomfrey became a traveling preacher and changed her name to fit her new life, Sojourner Truth. Truth traveled the country, preaching for both abolition and women's rights. Nobody ever helps me into carriages, <laughs> or over mud puddles, or gives me any best place. She was the voice of black women who didn't feel represented by an abolitionist movement that centered black men or a suffrage movement that centered white women. I have born 13 children, seen most sold off into slavery. And when I cried out with a mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? Her voice echoed for a century in the words of her most well-known speech, Ain't I a Woman? She spoke to the Ohio Women's Rights Convention in 1851 about the struggles of a black woman being left out of the fight for rights. Her words have had lasting influence and have been recognized as an example of intersectional feminism. Women can't have as much rights as men because Christ wasn't a woman. Well, where did your Christ come from? Number five, first inaugural address, Franklin D. Roosevelt, 1933. Good leaders use their words to inspire their people to endure hard times. Only a foolish optimist can deny the dark realities of the moment. And yet our distress comes from no failure of substance. In 1933, endurance was required the world over. Most countries were knee-deep in the Great Depression. In Europe, leaders like Hitler, Mussolini, and Franco utilized fear to come to power. In the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt did the opposite. In his famous inaugural address, Roosevelt claimed that fear was our true enemy. That, quote, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. That the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Americans would survive by banding together as a nation of good citizens and neighbors. Roosevelt laid out his plan to rescue the United States and didn't lean into division. I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis, broad, executive power. His words helped Americans ride out the remainder of the Great Depression and afterwards the Second World War. We face the arduous days that lie before us in the warm courage of national unity. Number four, Quit India, Mahatma Gandhi, 1942. The Quit India movement began with a speech by Mahatma Gandhi in August 1942, where he advocated for non-violent resistance to British occupation. The power when it comes, will belong to the people of India, and it will be for them to decide whom it is entrusted. Gandhi described himself as a friend of the British and framed the occupation as a mistake. In his words, Gandhi was trying to save the British from themselves. The speech resulted in the arrest of Gandhi and his compatriots less than a day later. They were imprisoned for the bulk of World War II, and the British violently cracked down on protesters. A democracy established by nonviolence, there will be equal freedom for all. Everybody will be its own master. Still, the seed had been planted and bloomed with the Indian Independence Act five years later. To this day, I believe non-cooperation with evil is a duty and that British rule of India is evil. Number three, we shall fight on the beaches. Winston Churchill, 1940. Uh, if you'll excuse me, gentlemen. <clears throat> I believe I am due to address Parliament. The opening salvos of World War II were sobering for the Allies. The Nazis quickly blew through France's seemingly impenetrable Maginot Line. In less than a month, England went from preparing for a swift victory to a terrifying defeat. The Prime Minister of England, Winston Churchill, had to guide his people through this emotional upheaval. That if all do their duty, if nothing is neglected, and the best arrangements are made as they are being made, we shall prove ourselves once more able to defend our island home. He also needed the island nation to prepare for a long and bitter siege. The Continental War was crossing the channel to England's shores. As hope was dwindling, Churchill resolutely stated that the British would never surrender. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Should the Germans come to England, they would find a nation ready to fight. Number two, Gettysburg Address, Abraham Lincoln, 1863. In terms of impact per word, few speeches can stack up to the Gettysburg Address. Four months after the deadliest battle of the Civil War, President Lincoln dedicated a national cemetery at the battlefield. Conceived in liberty, dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Possibly inspired by Pericles' funeral oration, 
Lincoln framed the war as a battle to uphold the principles of the Founding Fathers. That from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. The Union soldiers at Gettysburg died to protect democracy, equality, and liberty. The best way to honor them would be to continue the fight for those freedoms so that they never perish from the earth. These dead shall not have died in vain, and that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. The speech has since been referenced by other great orators like JFK and Martin Luther King Jr. In just 272 words, Abraham Lincoln inspired subsequent generations to fight for the principles that the United States is meant to stand for. I know the last part. It is, uh... Company up! It is rather... Move it out! Boys, best go and find your company. Thank you. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Before we unveil our top pick, here are a few honorable mentions. Address to the United Nations on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Eleanor Roosevelt, 1948. The first U.S. delegate to the U.N. emphasizes human rights. This Universal Declaration of Human Rights may well become the international Magna Carta of all men everywhere. Farewell to Baseball, Lou Gehrig, 1939. A national hero declares himself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. For the past two weeks, you've been reading about a bad break. Today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Women's right to vote. Susan B. Anthony, 1873. The American suffragette reacts to being arrested for voting. Webster, Worcester, and Bouvier all define a citizen to be a person in the United States entitled to vote and hold office. The only question left to be settled now is, are women persons? Mutiny at Opus, Alexander the Great, 324 BCE. According to Arian of Nicomedia, writing centuries later, Alexander delivered this impassioned speech. I get no more rest than you. Many times I have spent the night on watch so that you could sleep soundly. Who among you believes he's worked harder for me than I have for him? Address to the Women of America, Gloria Steinem, 1971. A feminist icon inspires a revolution in women's rights. We are talking about a society in which there will be no roles other than those chosen or those earned. We are really talking about humanism. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into settings and switch on your notifications. Number 1. I Have a Dream, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. On August 28, 1963, civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. led a quarter of a million people in a march on Washington. On the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, he gave the most famous and impactful speech of his career. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. A century after the Emancipation Proclamation ended slavery, black Americans were still not equal citizens. At one point, gospel singer Mahalia Jackson yelled out from the crowd, tell them about the dream, Martin. I have a dream. That my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. He deviated from his prepared remarks, improvising on the theme of his dream of what America could become. King frames the fight for civil rights as the moral legacy of America's foundational principles. One day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. His speech helped to build national support for what would become the Civil Rights Act. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.